Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Summer of Carnage right here on the Venom Vlog. And today we're going to do something different. This is obviously not really a Venom conversation for the most part, but it kind of applies in a way. So as you know, because we talked about it on the live stream the other day, so if you missed it, that's also why I wanted to cover this news in a separate smaller video that's more concise because of the content we're going to talk about. Um, but this is going to be more of a learning video in a way where I'm going to try to explain to you kind of the pre-production process and kind of go through a checklist that I have a couple sources here for. We have, um, you know, the ultimate pre-production checklist here, and I have that from Studio Binder's website. They're like a, they have a software that helps you organize all your scripts and everything like that. So a little shout out to them, I guess. So I'll put uh, all the links for this down below. And also um, the in the live video, we did the nine stages of pre-production. But um, in that video, I think I put a link in that description box. So if you want that one, go check out our live video where we go through those nine steps of pre-production um, based off of a, a fi uh, like an article from the New York Film Academy. Um, so it's like a student resources paper that someone posted, uh, Jack Picone posted online. But we talked about that in my other video. So just to make this video a little different, we're going to talk about this one from Studio Binder. But before we get into that, I do want to mention, obviously, the big news that came the other day, which was that Venom 2 started production, which means it is filming right now in London. And they posted an image right here. Tom Hardy posted this image of him in the makeup chair. I believe that woman who's with them, and I'm blanking on her name right now, uh, but she also did makeup and worked with Tom in the first movie. And I think she's worked with Tom on other stuff as well. And so, uh, so that image went up, and then Tom deleted it. And most people were, and I think that's part of the strategy. I think because sometimes Tom does that, he posts things and he deletes them, and then it causes a bunch of websites to go, "Wait, what's he doing? What's he talking about? What's what's going on?" Um, and I think that's kind of the intention uh, of that, obviously, because ultimately the picture still got out there. Uh, it's no longer on his Instagram, but it's still out there circulating, and people are talking about it. Here, it's here in my video. So, uh, so obviously, job well done. It's part of the marketing strategy, uh, and that's kind of how Tom did in the first movie too. He did some of that as well. So, uh, so that's cool, whether it's intentional or not whether he accidentally, you know, posted it and got, to, got told to take it down on, on for real, you know, like if that happened, uh, either way it was effective and it worked. So um, that image shows that we are now in production, which means they're filming. So back earlier this year, I think it was uh, Ricky and a couple other people started posting, Venom's going to film in Atlanta in November. And I started, I got a little upset by that because I was like, who told you? Like where, I see no news articles about this. And uh, Ricky was really cool and he wrote me and said, actually Atlanta Filming, who's a guy you used in season one, um, he now, it, you know, he posted that this is a possibility. And Atlanta Filming, as I mentioned in season one, he always says, don't use me as a source. I just say what I hear. Sometimes that informa information changes or, you know, it, it's not true. So I was like, all right, well, uh, that's great that he said it because he was right about a lot of things uh, in the first movie. But like Carlton Drake, like we got some of the character names uh, and Reese, like we got all those character names from him. Um, and that was at least my source. I don't know if other people had other sources, but I saw him posted. So he actually changed his Twitter account to private. And luckily, you know, if you follow him, he has, you have, he has you have to request and he'll allow it. Luckily, he allowed me to follow him, which is really nice to follow him on Instagram too. He seems like a really nice guy, very level headed. And he, you know, he even says, don't use me as a source. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I'll just put information out there. And sometimes he is also, he's trying to protect his reputation and stuff in his career so there's some things he's like i didn't post this or i took this picture and i'm not posting it but someone hacked my you know my camera or my my gear and that picture got out there and i got no credit for it, it, it you know so he, he has his you know issues and bridges he has to cross too um so when ricky and everyone pointed that out i was like okay well i'll, I'll pull back on my upsetness because you know he has been right before so we'll see where this goes uh, but then it was when Andy Circus came on they made the decision to film in London at the Warner Brother lot which is why Tom posted this second picture of uh, the dog blue here um, and uh, really great really cute image I think I saw someone on Twitter going does this mean the dog from Donny Cates run is going to be in it like a symbiote dog and it's like well we kind of got a symbiote dog in the first movie even though it didn't show the symbiote around the dog um, but we kind of got that in the first movie uh, but uh, but no I don't think this signals that uh, obviously Tom is a big dog lover dog rescuer he actually just posted this image got posted today with an article i'll put down below where he's um there was a dog that uh the one that was involved in the raid of like a, a terrorist cell and this in that where the terrorists like you know died and you know killed themselves uh, because they didn't want to be captured this dog was part of the raid and so it was like zero bark 30 is like the the sticker and tom was you know putting that sticker up um around town so uh so that was pretty cool so i'll have that image there to show that tom does love dogs um but that image before with blue Blue, um, in it, there's a, uh, a badge, a Warner Brothers badge that says Fillmore, and that is obviously the code name of the movie. We talked about that a few months ago, where the new Venom 2 movie is going to film under the name 
Fillmore. Uh, and so that is why that badge says it. They're filming at Warner Brothers lot in London, which is great. There's a lot of great things filmed there. I think Krypton might have filmed there. And the original Star Wars, I can't remember. I, but a lot of stuff films over in London, like really great things. And it does, doesn't mean the movie is going to be great just based on that. Uh, I think the movie is going to hopefully be great and better than the first one based on the, the cast and the crew uh, and, you know, and everyone that they're bringing on board and the writing and stuff like that. I have, uh, you know more optimism for this one for sure like i i don't mind the first movie but i definitely want this one to be better and i think there's the right people involved to make that happen so i hope it does um so yeah film more that's what it's being it's named under named under and it's it's filming in london right now so that's great that's also where they filmed morbius i think uh, i don't know if it was at the warner brothers lot but they filmed over in london as well and i think they're doing some of that because maybe tom is going to make a cameo they're like i said they might first week of filming they might get the morbius cameo out of the way so that they can give that footage to the morbius people um so maybe that's you know what's happening too we don't know uh but uh i'm, I'm curious that they're building sets over there so they're, they're probably going to do a lot of internal shooting over in london and not a lot of external stuff uh, because that would be a lot of hard work digitally to change things to make it not look like you know london uh where but there's but then again maybe close-up shots or other things are like something in an alley they can get away with uh but that's what location scouting and stuff's for so we're going to get into pre-production here in a second but i just wanted to talk about that here clearly on a video that and acknowledge some people are like hey didn't you know venom was you know filming right now why didn't you make a video on it it's like well we did we did a live video uh but i understand i didn't name that video i didn't like give it a name so when i do the thumbnails for it i'm going to create them this weekend uh and try to post them up this week it'll say you know what we talked about in that video so as i said right now venom 2 is filming but a lot goes into making a movie before you even roll the camera before you get to the filming day you got to put a lot of work into making your movie and that's called pre-production and we know some of this we know how far back this goes because in february that's when they officially said kelly marcel was starting on the script with tom hardy you know kind of there with her uh, i'm guessing in a consulting position and as the actor playing you know eddie brock he, like i always say he probably just wants the script to be very clear because uh, we heard uh some rumors don't know if it's true but we heard some rumors in the first movie that he had problems with the script and he didn't want to say certain lines and from what i understand that's when he brought kelly marcel on to help write the movie i could be wrong there but that's just the timeline i was putting together that's what it looked like and she's worked on stuff with tom i think peaky blinders and other things and, and he really trusts her and so and he liked what she brought to the table so for the sequel they took off the other two or three writers and they you know they removed them completely and as of right now she is the only writer of this film and i think that could only help the movie by having that one clear voice and with tom you know overlooking it and then Andy coming in and bringing his like, you know, visual flair to it and working with the actors to get strong performances. I think this is a good combination. Like that, that's just my opinion, obviously, but um, they, so they started in February where she was writing the script. And even at that point, there are people when they get the script or get pages of it that are drawing things even before they see the script sometimes, um, depending on how fast they got to, you know, move things along. Obviously they wanted this sequel to come out because the first one was so successful. Tom went and filmed like a, an Ebenezer Scrooge movie and Andy Serkis is in that. And I think that's probably where the two of them connected and probably how in some way that and besides his talent obviously the andy got on the short list for directors uh, to be for venom 2 and probably how he beat out everyone else because tom showed his support for him before it was officially announced and he had to delete that too um so that was you know really great so that so they have a working relationship they already worked together and so i'm excited to see them work together here but so back in february we had the script going and then they probably, you know, I don't know how long they spent on the script. I don't know if it was months or they're, they're still making tweaks on it. I'm sure that's what happens. Kelly's probably even on set, you know, tweaking things from time to time when they, as they film, that's always going to be the case. And actors will bring things to the table and the director will bring things. They'll do table reads. So we're going to get into all the pre-production stuff. But so from February kind of till a couple days ago, um, in some manner, they were in pre-production, but the real pre-production stages probably took place over the past couple months even though i would say they probably officially began almost right when the first movie came out and they made all that money <laughs> they were probably like let's get going um but they have artists working on stuff you know people drawing uh the main thing you want to do is you want to lock your shooting script so kelly marcel did a first draft and i'm sure she did many drafts after because that's the thing with movies is you get notes from the studio you get notes from the actors you get notes from you know uh different people who are working on the film and have a say in it and you know and based off things that investors if investors are getting involved they'll be like all right we want to play it safe in this regard because we have this investor involved and it things change all the time it's hard work uh, when you write a movie you don't just write a movie you write a movie a thousand times almost uh, before the movie finally comes out and then even when you make a film they always say you make a movie three times one movie three times 
uh, in the script phase, uh, and then when you film it, and then when you edit it. Uh, it's almost sometimes three different movies, and they try, a lot of people try to get it close to that original vision, but obviously then the director comes in, and then the editors work together, and they bounce ideas off each other. So a movie gets made three times is, is a saying they say in Hollywood. And so locking a shooting script is important. Once you have that, you're like, okay, we can start doing these other things. Uh, we need to finalize the budget. What's the budget of the movie going to be? So that's where they go out and they get investors. They go and talk to people and say, hey, uh, what, you know, are you you invested in the first film? What about this one? I think that company Tencent, who was, um, you know, did like, I think Transformers, like release in China. They did the Venom release in China. They do video games and mobile games and stuff. Um, I think they're getting in some hot water right now with some fans with like, uh, I don't know if it was Call of Duty or, or something else like mobile. There was like something, but that's like, you know, in that, in that fandom, like they're kind of going after Tencent a little bit. Um, but that company might get involved. So who knows, you know, who knows uh, what investors they'll get and how much money they can bring to the table. Cause that's what it is. It's not like Sony goes, all right, our budget's a hundred and like the last movie was 90 to a hundred million dollars. I hope this one doesn't go up too, too much. I hope it just goes to like 125 or something. I don't want it to go to like 150 or, or double or go to 200 just because they made money the first time. I hope they're still rational about this. This one, they're probably going to increase it a little bit because it because it made money and because they want to do different things with it. And Andy Serkis might have a different way to create Venom than the first movie did that could be more expensive or not. You don't know because you got you to start getting your production heads in there too. So finalizing the budget that's a big thing um based off of the script and based off what sony's willing to you know are able to come up with because they'll be like all right we can pay this amount but we're gonna have to go and get other investors to give us 20 million here 30 million here and that'll get us to our you know 100 and you know 25 million dollar budget and then we'll try to get some other investors to help us with the marketing of it or whatever so um so that's that's kind of what finalizing the budget is then starting your business that's uh that's you know and again i'm going down these key points here from studio binder um, so these aren't like, a, I mean, these are accurate, but there, there's going to be some steps I miss or some things because every movie is different. There's different steps in different movies. Indie films are different. They may have fewer steps um, or, 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 you know, not as much work in a particular step than a big budget movie will. So, the, you know, th that keep that in mind as I'm going through these lists. Um, hiring key production heads. So that's the thing you want, like your, you know, whatever your grip and lighting guy, the head of that department, you want to hire them, make sure they're really good. Uh, based off work they've done either for you in the past or for other people. Um, you want to go through and look at the art department. All right, who's really good at that? I want to find a, a strong head for that department. Um, sets and design and building and uh, visual effects. I want to go and find the key people at the top. And then those people will then uh, recommend and hire uh, themselves the people that work under them. So like grip and lighting and best boy, you know, they'll just go down and hire all the way down to P someone will get, you know, become a production coordinator, a production manager, and then they'll hire a production coordinator. And then that person will hire a PA or a couple PAs. And it just goes down the list, like from there. So starting with the production heads is good, getting all your departments uh, keyed up, and then you can start having conversations about tech scouting and stuff. So then after that, you break down the script, you go through it again, make any changes you need to, and you create the storyboards. And like I said, not these aren't in order too. Sometimes things on bigger budget movies, they might have people drawing first, at least concept designs and things like that. And then, you know, Kelly might see those and, and work on the script, or maybe you'd say, I don't want to see any of that. I'll just work on the script on my own. And you guys go do your drawings. Like it, it depends. It changes all the time. And then every movie is different in some regard regarding these steps. Um, but creating the storyboards is big. I have a friend who does storyboard artist. He was going to be the artist on the um, Black Cat Silver Sable movie before that went away. And I would have liked to have seen him do that. I mean, because I'm his friend. I want him to get work. Uh, but he works on a lot of other stuff, too. He's doing a lot of cool movies. And I think a lot of them with Sony, too, which is awesome. Um, so big shout out to him. And he's great because, you know, I never ask. When I have friends that are like, oh, I'm working on this movie, I don't want to know. Like, I know some people in my position who run a YouTube show might be like, oh, give me tips. And, you know, I want to, you know. And then it's like, that's why my channel doesn't grow to the level it does because I'm not a bastard. <laughs> like, I'm not going to treat a friend like that. If someone out there is working really hard to keep their career, I'm not going to put that career in jeopardy just to get a few views on a video. Uh, that's stupid to do. And I know there are people out there that do that. So, uh, so I'm not going to be like that. So like when, when, so like when he told me, Oh, I might be working on blackout service over, I'm like, <clears throat> well, don't tell me anything. I go, but I hope you get the job. I hope you, you know the job stays and the movie stays. And then when it went away, I was bummed because it's my friend and I want him to to get work. But luckily, he went right to something else. So so good for him. Then after you break it down the script, you create the storyboards. Then you start scouting and securing locations. So obviously they were like they had to look for sound stages, 
And for whatever reason, they were like, we're going to go to London and use the Warner Brothers sound stages. That happens a lot. I worked at Sony and they filmed non Sony movies there. Definitely. Um, that happens all the time. You just, you're looking for a sound stage. You got to rent space. You need it. You know, you want to get certain crew members or people there. Uh, Sony's a good place because it's not too far from the airport. Like Warner Brothers is pretty good because it's near Bob Hope Airport, but LAX is kind of over in that area where, um, you know, Sony is. So it's not too far. So you, you sometimes you think about that when you're, when you're, you know, thinking of what stage you want to go to. I think in these London stages, I think there's airports near that one as well. So um, so you want to scout and secure locations that's in based on the script. You're like, we need an exterior building. Uh, all right, the first movie filmed that exterior here. So for continuity sakes, we might do that. Or the script says that, or maybe Anne moved to a new apartment. So we're just going to film a completely new building because maybe she just moved to a new apartment uh, as her relationship with the other guy you know, got better or whatever, uh, Dan. So maybe they got a, a better apartment somewhere else in San Francisco. So you can, they can make those decisions and they come up with what they need and then they go out and start scouting. And like I said, they might, they, maybe they can't get a permit for that first location for whatever reason, maybe something else filming there or they can't, or the people who live there don't, and the new people that live there don't want them to use that building anymore or whatever. There's a lot of reasons you can't get locations. So then they go, okay, well now change it in the script and lives in a new building. Uh, yeah, so there, there are things like that. So scouting and secure locations, that's big. And then you also do tech scouts. So you'll have the head of some of those departments there. And this is where I'll, I'll say, go watch Kevin Smith's videos. I'll try to find a link to one or two of them and I'll put them down below. The Road to Reboot, his new James and Bob movie. He did a really good job um, kind of breaking down what some of the pre-production stuff they did, including a tech scout and, uh, and table reads. And so we'll talk about that uh, coming up. But tech scout is on this list. And that's where you'll have, you'll bring your uh, heads of departments to certain locations and go, what are you going to need here? Because this is what we got to film. And someone might be like, well, it would be great to have a jib here. So we got, maybe if we could have like a, a super crane or a super jib, we can get these kind of shots and it'll add some scope to it. And these are things that the director will go, oh, you know what? I don't want scope in this one. I want this to be a personal scene based on the script. It, this is what it feels like. I don't want to go too over the top with it or too big with it because of this reason. <clears throat> and this is where you talk that kind of stuff out and you figure out what gear and tech that you're going to need on the days of those shoots when you're in those locations. You got to plan all that stuff out because when you get there, you got to remember people, you're probably filming outside someone's apartment. People are living there. And they, when they filmed San Francisco, they were, you know, racing cars at like 2 a.m., you know, ramping off stuff and crashing down. And they were doing that at 2 a.m. And people were sticking their head out the windows at 2 a.m. filming. But then there's other people sticking their head out the windows going, shut up, you know. Uh, but that's before they film, they do give notices. They're supposed to put up stickers going, hey, we're filming here during these hours on this day. <clears throat> so that way they're being, you know, considerate going, Hey, we understand you have to sleep and you got to go to work the next day. Uh, but we got we're filming a movie. We got to work too, and we got a permit for it. So I'm sorry, but at 2 a.m. or from from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., we're gonna make a ton of noise. And so uh, so then you're like, all right, I'm planning an all nighter of staying up that night or whatever. So you know, there that's where all that comes in. That's where all this you know pre production stuff. Um, casting your talent. Obviously, you're gonna you start casting up um, and and getting the actors that you need. Sometimes you won't get every actor in your movie on pre-production. Sometimes it happens. It's rare. It happens. Um, but uh, what you'll do is when you do your table read of the script, you'll have everyone sitting around a table and you'll be like, all right, we don't have that role cast yet. So we're going to have someone else read for that part. We'll either bring someone in um, or we'll have like Tom Hardy. Why don't you do It's only a couple lines. Why don't you read that police officer's lines? They'll do stuff like that um, because they can't cast. They just, they're only doing the main characters. Any like smaller characters that probably haven't cast yet. And even sometimes the main characters, they might be like, well, we're still negotiating with their agent. So we don't have them here yet. They can't do the table read. So Michelle, can you read Shriek's parts too, you know, until we have that actors come in? That could be the case. Also sometimes, and they usually when, by the time they're filming, um, they're, they really are cast up. I think X-Men though, they had Doug Ree Scott was going to be Wolverine. And then like a week or so before they started filming, he dropped out to go film Mission Impossible 2 and or his schedule couldn't work out or something like I can't remember. But so that's how they found Hugh Jackman. And the film, they already filmed like two weeks worth of X-Men before Hugh Jackman came in. And that's why he even says, he goes, that's why I'm not ripped in the first movie, because I had no time to train. He's like, I, I was on Broadway, so I'm still kind of lean, but but I'm not like ripped like I am with in every other X-Men movie. And he goes, because I was cast like two weeks into them filming it. So sometimes that happens. And then uh, what they'll do is they'll save any casting news because they want to optimize, you know, press. They'll be like, all right, we cast everyone, but Black Panther came out. 
and it did really well. So now we can put an article that Shope Aluko is in our movie. She's in Black Panther and we cast her in Venom. And some people are going to go, how'd they cast her? The movie finished filming two months ago. And it's like, they filmed, they, they filmed all of her stuff, you know, like four or five months ago. They're just announcing it to ride that coattail of, uh, of popularity that Black Panther has to bring more attention to their movie and to stay in the spotlight. That's what marketing is all about. So that's why they don't always reveal everyone right up top. Um, rev up the art department. I talked about that already with the techs uh, and crewing up. Definitely want to get a good art department team in place. You want to get people that can build really good sets. You want to get costumes and makeup. You want to start getting all that. And we saw when Andy Circus first got the job, he posted on Instagram, hey, I'm going to be directing Venom 2. The symbiote found a new host or whatever he put on there. And he tagged like seven or eight people in it. And it was like Tom and Sony. But then there was like a makeup person and there was like all these people. And then if you go and click that post, and look in the comments, there are people going, hey, you're working on this? I am too. And then I clicked on them and I just started following all of them. Even though some of them, they were like, request to follow. And I did and they still haven't, you know, accepted me. That's fine. But I was just like, I want to follow everyone who's on this movie so we can maybe learn more about them. And I can accurately talk about what they bring to the table for this movie and, and what jobs they have and stuff like that in this movie and do my best. So that's why I followed all them. And so sometimes they'll pop up my feed and I go, Who's this? Like what? And I'll click on them. I'll go, oh, right. They're Andy Circus tagged them, you know, months and months ago. So, um, yeah. So rev up the art department, get a good crew, get all your people. And it looks like they've been doing that since they announced Andy Circus. Everyone started getting hired for the movie. So, um, so they've had a crew in place and they've had people going, doing these, uh, you know, all the stuff we're going through on this list. They've been doing it for months now, probably. So uh, permits and insurance, that's really the paperwork side of everything. You're going to have to go. You, they have a whole team that, like, calls locations, uh, you know, talks to officials in the government and mayors and everything like that. And they have to talk and get permits to film at certain locations if they're doing exterior shots. And then they got to explain, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring in a crew of 30 or 40 people. So you have to know exactly what you're bringing um, because you, there's no wiggle room there sometimes. And you're like, uh, because if you screw up something, or you, or you blow up a car that wasn't supposed to be blown up, um, then that causes problems. So that's why you have to go through all this red tape, all this paperwork, get these permits, get insurance, get all your actors insured in case they get hurt on the job, get your stunt people insured, you know, the, your background, extra, you get everyone, you know, uh, insured. You want to make sure everyone's safe. I think uh, sometimes directors have to go through physicals and uh, because of the endurance, sometimes it takes making a movie. Um, there's all this stuff. I mean, everyone's safety is a concern. Um, and, uh, and, you know, sadly people do die making movies. I think there was a stunt woman that, uh, one that died on a resident evil movie and another that like lost her arm or something. And it's tragic. It's really tragic because first of all, in my opinion, a resident evil movie shouldn't have a motorcycle chasing in it at all. It should be filmed in a house uh, with like very safe, you know, props, you know, like if the ceiling's coming down to crush you, it should be like a foam ceiling that won't actually crush anybody. You know, like these are things that I think of when I think of Resident Evil, I don't think of like giant motorcycle action scenes. I know those are in like the fifth and sixth games to some extent, but that's not how I would approach a movie. And I would never want to put a stunt person's life in harm's way you know, to do a stupid stunt in a movie that I feel like shouldn't have one. But, uh, but you know, that's that's my own personal taste and why I disagree with Sony taking an action route with the Resident Evil franchise. But, uh, but safety is a concern. Permits are a thing. You want to make sure that where you are filming, people in that area are going to know you're going to be there. They're going to know that you are doing a, uh, you know, the motorcycle chase scene from the first Venom movie, which, again, I kind of railed against that, too. Um, but I know Tom likes motorcycles, and it was a really well done scene, and luckily no one got hurt. But still, I'm like, ah, it's Venom. I pro I personally wouldn't have put the money into a, a chase scene like that. But uh, but they did, and and they have to get permits, and they have to make sure everyone in that street where they're crashing cars knows that they're going to be crashing cars for like five hours or six hours in the middle of the night. So um so yeah, so that's what that is. Scheduling your shoot, make you know, going through and going. These are the days you can create a shot list to, to help with some of this too. Your shot list is like taking beats from the script, putting in the storyboards or like a still image that you take. Or like if you go and do a photo, you know, when you're at the tech scout, you can take photos and you do these things. Then you're just like, all right, here's our shot list. And we're going to go boom, 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 boom. And you have this cool comprehensive look of like where you want to do. This is so the director can have like put their vision on paper and use it as a tool, but not follow it explicitly either if they don't want to because on the day sometimes you're like you know what i just came up with a great idea and then you'll use that as your foundation your shot list and then you'll tweak it or you know work it as long as you have the tech to do it and you're not 
you know, putting, you're not pushing anyone to do a job they weren't intending to do that day either. You got to be very cautious and safe about that. And like I said, when crewing up, like, because that, they mentioned that on here, that's when you hire the department heads and then a lot of them will crew up. Um, but you'll, you know, sometimes, because it's weird, it's not like Andy Serkis picks everyone that works on this movie. He might have a say in like who his cinematographer is, or he might have a say in like who the, the composer is or something like that, or obviously who's cast in the movie. He'll have a say in everything. But uh, but in a lot of things, but like he's not going to, you know, hire the PAs. He's not going to hire craft service, probably, uh, unless he worked on a movie where the craft service was amazing. And he's like, you know what? I want them back. Try to get them, you know, or whatever. But that's a, a personal thing. But typically that's not what's going to happen. So crewing up, creating your shot list, uh, tech scouts we talked about and gearing up. That's when you go, all right, this is the gear that we're going to need after our tech scout. After we did all that, we're going to need jibs. We're going to need drones to do this shot. We're going to need whatever. Uh, we're going to need camera mounts because we're going to be filming inside of a car. So we're going to need this kind of camera mount because Andy Circus wants a shot inside the car. But we also need a camera mount on the outside of the car shooting through the window. Um, so that way, you know, we can get that perspective as well or whatever. And we need a camera looking in the back seat you start thinking of all this stuff. And again, you create these lists. So it's just like, boom, boom, boom. So when you get there on the day, there's no surprises. I have been on shoots where they're like, we get there and they're like, we don't have that. And it's like, what do you mean we don't have that? We did the tech scout. We did this. It, you know, it happens. And they're like, we're, we're sending, we sent somebody back to the warehouse to pick it up. Don't worry. It'll be here in like 30 minutes, you know, whatever. I've been there. I've been the person to go pick up that gear sometimes. And like, step on it. And I'm like, what about cops? They're like, forget the cops. No, you know, they're not like that, but they're like safety first. Don't kill yourself. Just go get the gear, come back here, you know? So there's a lot. I mean, you're talking about a thousand people plus sometimes. I think the first Venom movie, we counted almost a thousand people worked on it or around a thousand people, like 900 plus people uh, or 990 something people. It was like really close to a thousand. I'm sure ultimately, you know, in some way it did pass a thousand, but that was to work on Venom 1. And, uh, and that was a smaller budget movie. So you think about something like Avengers Endgame, probably, uh, you know, had probably had like 5,000 or 10,000 people working for it in some capacity. I think Spider-Verse had a lot of people too, because they had people animating only certain segments and artists only do certain drawings. And I think they, they probably employed like 10,000 people or something crazy like that. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is, it's a big endeavor. I mean, there's a lot that goes into making a movie and people don't really think about that, uh, especially movie reviewers. That's why I typically try not to review stuff or I, I try to factor in the amount of hard work that goes into something and that sometimes affects my rating of it because I'll be like, look, I, I normally would give this based on just story and visuals and acting. I would give this a two, but because I know the amount of work that goes into something, um, whether we think that work was well used or not is, is comes a personal choice, but it might help me. It might make me bump something up to like a two to a four or something like that, because I'll be like, yeah, you know, it, 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 it employed this many people and that's good overall. Everybody's got to work and eat and feed their families. But, um, but yeah, so it will affect sometimes my rating. It'll, it'll make me go more positive because I'll be like, man, like I know that the lighting people tried their best. They came, they did their job. And I don't want to just crap all over the scene when they at least did their job, you know? So it's like, it does factor in, but that's, I mean, this is even longer, more than nine steps. than we talked about last time, this is a full 30 minute video uh, where the first five minutes we talked about the, you know, the movie going into production, but then the last 20 plus minutes or so just talking about pre-production and this doesn't even cover every little thing. I mean, there's little nuances and beats inside each of these steps that there's so much more to. Uh, so I'm going to put a link to this uh, studio binder one down below and uh, the nine stages of pre-production uh, uh, from New York Film Academy from 2017. I'll put that. I have that link already in the other video, the live video episode two. Uh, that's where we talked about it. Um, but this one is from 2019. It came out this year. So I thought it was pretty up to date and it had a lot of great things in it. It is promoting their um, their software too. So that's fine. If it, maybe some of you out there are screenwriters and you got a bunch of scripts that you're trying to organize, it looks like this is a good thing to use. So and this is not me just trying to do a plug for this website, but this I found this really useful. I went through like six or seven websites and I just thought this one was the most useful and it covered the most information, I feel, too. Because pre-production, there's a lot of work. This does not even do it any justice. There's so much that goes on. And now now we're in the production stages. So now we get after all of that hard work and all those people, some of those people might not even end up working on the production side of the movie. Some of them may be done with their job now, or they might come in and work on something in editing. Uh, but probably a lot of these people are like, our job's done. Now the movie's filming. 
and and we are i'm done with storyboards i'm done you know with this we're done casting we're done you know whatever like they you know i'll be casting still goes through the movie because they'll get like um background extras and things like that so they'll still have you know work to do to to an extent um but like they don't and hopefully they got all their permits i've been on shoots though where we're like on the way to film somewhere and we're like wait we didn't get permission to film there and i'm like calling people at disney going Hey, we we need to be at the Luau, you know, in like in the two hours we're gonna be there. Any chance you can get us clearance? You know, I know it's last minute. We were supposed to call yesterday or two days ago. It's like I've been there, you know, I totally have been there. <laughs> where uh, where someone on the crew is just you know like a coordinator or manager is just has too much on their mind, and they overlook something little. That's why there are multiple people like production manager, coordinator, PAs. Everyone's got to try to help each other out, and hopefully in the end they and they all do their small part hoping that the in the grand scheme of things when all these smart small parts come together it turns into a fantastic movie and that's why when some people like crap on stuff i'm just like not everyone set out to do a bad job you know a lot of people just showed up to do their job what's required of them and they did their best and then so that's always something to factor in and that's why i wanted to make this video to show how much hard work goes into doing the pre-production before you even start filming the movie before tom hardy posted that post the other day being in the makeup chair all of this happened and a lot more. So um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this about pre-production itself. I'm glad I got to make this video for you guys before the end of the season. And I think my next video will be the toxin review, but I got to go finish reading it and then I'll probably post it in, the, in a couple days or so. Um, and I'll try to get it up before Absolute Carnage 5 comes out on Wednesday. And if you think I got any of this information wrong, let me know in the comments below. I mean, I'm going off this website, but it doesn't mean it's 100% accurate or maybe I misspoke about something when you know translating some of these steps. So that's possible. So let me know down below if you have more knowledge about it than I do. But I know I've worked on some things in pre-production i mostly worked in post-production so uh stuff so i'll have more to say when we get to that phase of this movie but i like making these videos where it's a little bit more educational based in the, in the sense where it's like maybe someone out there learns something now about what it takes to make a movie and just how much hard work it is and hopefully that changes your perspective on movies in general um, because that's the lens i look at movies all the time is i look at how much work went into it whether i like it or not that's a different thing because i'll rate that separately but every movie has a ton of hard work put into it so let me know what your thoughts are down below and as always we'll continue our conversation down there thanks so much for watching the show i'll see you in the future peace